Good morning and welcome to Trinity. And I mean that. It's good to see each one of you. If you're a guest, I'd invite you to look in the pew rack in front of you and you'll see a little guest card. It says, Welcome to Trinity. And I'd invite you to fill out that registration card and put it in the offering plate later on in that service. And we would send you an email or write you a note and just give you some more information about our church. I'd invite everyone now to pull out your bulletin and we'll go over a few announcements. Today our college students are having a little back to school lunch and send off at Terra Nova's right after this service and you're, if you're an upcoming freshman and you're about to go off to college for the first time you're invited to that too and all the college students when you get there it's our treat. Motivation? <laughs> Amen. Youth broom ball this afternoon at the Iceplex from 3 to 6 p.m. And meet at the Iceplex, okay? If you meet here, you'll meet here all the time from 3 to 6 p.m. Nobody else will be here, okay? Huh? If they need a ride, let, let Teresa know, okay? All right, great. Wednesday is the start of school here in town, so we're trying something new. We've heard from parents, so we're trying something a little bit new. No evening program that night for children and youth, uh, but adult, choir, adult prayer meeting uh, and choir will happen as usual, okay? The, uh, the youth will meet at Brewster's from 6 to 8 p.m. just to hang out, okay? So come on out to Brewster's. Uh, next Sunday is Promotion Sunday. Uh, all preschool children and youth will be promoted into their 2016-17 Sunday school classes and will also return to having the 8.30 and 10.30 worship services. Okay? At this time, I'd invite you to stand and greet one another and pass the peace of Christ. I get everything. seems to be a good buzz in the church this morning. That's not in my notes. I just wanted to say that. We've just returned from another wonderful experience in, on a Perry County mission trip. Several of y'all have been on those. This year we worked at the high school. That's something new for us. We cleaned out and painted all the lockers at the high school. That was a unique experience. We found papers in there from the 1990s. We didn't read those papers. <laughs> We read enough stuff on the lockers. Uh, <laughs> is this being recorded? <laughs> Welcome back, Glenn. Can we edit some of this out, Mike? <laughs> Uh, we weed eat it, we power washed all the sidewalks. Hey, it's hot in Perry County. Those guys that did that, they were out there all day. We weed eat it, power washed all the sidewalks, and we did a bunch more stuff. It really looked like a different place when we left. Uh, we partnered with First Baptist Church Williams. You ever heard of that church? That's a pretty good little church. Got some good people there. Uh, they, it was a real good experience. We partnered with Alabama CBF that put all that together. As you remember, last year, uh, the schools were consolidated uh, and, and being pushed together. Many of y'all were there. Uh, uh, Perry County school systems go, is a difficult time, and if you look at the demographics going on down there, it's, it's, it's pretty difficult. But we're trying to partner with them and, and assist in that whole process, and we're continuing to do that. But as the consolidation is going on, this meant that room after room, teacher after teacher, uh, having to relocate to another building, uh, we wound up helping the special education department, and, and we, they were there needing our assistance. So 
we helped move some rooms. The special ed teachers found out that we were going to be at the high school yesterday, so during our lunch, we're sitting around eating ham sandwiches and turkey sandwiches, mostly on white bread. Yeah, boy. Um, we were eating lunch, so they showed up and presented this to Trinity to say thank you for helping them out last year. And they presented this to our church to say thanks. Yeah, it's pretty sharp. And it says, May the Lord bless you and keep you, number 624, Francis Marion School, Special Education Department. And then they said, uh, Thank you for coming. Uh, and, and obviously they were deeply touched as, what they, as we were. They said, Hang this in, our, in your church. When you see it, no, we remember you, and we're praying for you. And also, remember and pray for us in Perry County. There's only one response to that. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and that's why we do these trips. Building relationships, nurturing community, serving, tri uh, serving Jesus. We go and serve. We went as a church. It was a great trip. We'll continue to partner with them. When you see this, remember Perry County. Remember why we go. Amen. Welcome to Trinity. Pray with me. Lord, our Father, what a privilege for us to be in your house today. We praise you and we worship you. We are thankful for the life that comes from you, the living cells that make up each of us, the sun and the rain, the colors of nature, green and blue and yellow and red. We ask that you guide us to be loving and compassionate, to be a friend to those in need, and to be like Jesus in the way we live our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us now sing together our hymn of assurance, hymn number 350, The Church's One Foundation. Please stand as we sing together. So 
Please be seated. Glenn and I visited a lot of churches across the whole country this summer. Um, that was a really unusual experience. Um, it was really good. Um, I did enjoy seeing that there are so many faithful folks across the United States who gather, and across the world, uh, who gather Sunday after Sunday. And um, it was great to feel a part of that larger uh, church experience. But there were things, many things about Trinity that I missed. One of them is our Be Still and No Time. So I invite you now to join me as we uh, take a few moments to make space for God to fill us with the things that we need for this week. Please join me in silence and prayer. Oh God, this world offers us so many things that can clutter up our hearts and our minds. We ask that you help us clear through those things that keep us from you and from your peace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Morning. Today I'll be reading Daniel. Verse, um, chapter 9, verses 15 through 19, and I'm reading from the New International Version. Now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day? We have sinned, we have done wrong. O Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our fathers have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, O Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give, eat, give ear, O God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make request of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, listen. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, near and act. Hear and act. For your sake, O oh my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. May God bless the reading of his word. <coughs> At this time, our pre-K and our kindergartners are invited to exit for children's worship as we sing together our song of faith, Lord, I Need You. You can find the words printed on the front of your worship order. Please stand as we sing together.
This summer, 60 students who are exploring call and clarity about local church ministry will serve through Student Church. Both college students and seminarians, these men and women are spending the summer at CBF partner churches throughout the United States and even Puerto Rico. The interns will participate in all aspects of congregational ministry. They will visit hospitals, attend deacon meetings, and explore the financial aspects of congregational life. They will preach, worship, and go on a myriad of camps and mission trips. Ministers will mentor them, congregations will welcome them, and they will make friends that will remain long after the summer. Even so, internships can be stressful for all involved, staff and students alike. There is a great deal of unknown, unstated expectations and upheaval in the 10 weeks of ministry. It takes courage for the student to serve in grace and hospitality on behalf of the church that welcomes them. Please pray for the students who will serve, the congregations that will care for them, and for the staff that will prepare and make room for them. Pray that the students, staff, and congregations will be open to all ways that they will see Christ manifested in the summer. These opportunities are boundless. Please join me in a moment of silent prayer. Amen. Always proud when our youth lead us in worship. Thank you, praise team, and our adult praise team. I thought that was wonderful. I'm also looking forward next Sunday for our, our adult choir, our sanctuary choir, to be back in the loft behind me. It just makes me feel better. I'll put it that way. But glad that you uh, all are here today. Thank you for choosing to worship and being with us at Trinity. 
By the way, this morning we did the Big Enough for Big Church experience for our smallest children here who are beginning to learn to be in church. Some of them will go out, as you know, at a certain point to little church or children's church, and then some of them are beginning to stay in church for the first time. Next Sunday will be their first Sunday to sit through the whole service. Two of them will receive their Bibles, their little Bibles that we give to our first graders. And I wanted just to say that it was really neat as they went through. I didn't know what was going to happen when Teresa sits them down and says, okay, you got any questions for Pastor Mike? And you never know what you're going to get. Uh, one of the questions is, what's your favorite color? So I think I could handle some of those. But I wanted to say to you parents, thank you. One of the greatest gifts that you can give to your children is to bring them to church where they are spiritually shaped and they learn about belonging to a community of people as they work out their own salvation under the guidance of friends and family in church. So thank you parents for doing that. I wanted to also just say, because I was on vacation last week when the Bowers came back, I knew they were coming, so I took a week off just to get ready. <laughs> Read Glenn in that. But I'm so glad that they're back. It was nice sitting up here on the stage with all of our staff here for the first time in about eight weeks, I think, through the summer with sabbatical and vacations. But we're surely glad that Glenn and Teresa are back with us. We appreciate the opportunity that you give our staff for vacations and sabbaticals. And uh, we're excited to be all ready to go full swing into our summer, I mean, our uh, fall program as we begin that next week. Beginning, I've been preaching a series through the last few weeks on prayers from the Old Testament, and this is our last in that series. It is a prayer from the book of Daniel. One commentator begins his commentary on the book of Daniel with these words, From the depths of despair comes a faith that refuses to abandon the belief that the universe operates according to God's will, even though it's unfolding cannot always be seen. That's a good way to think about the book of Daniel. Daniel has the great stories that some of us as children learned. Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel with the group Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They would not bow, they would not bend, and they would not burn in that fiery furnace. Daniel has a lot of wonderful stories in it. In the second part there's this prayer and then these visions of the future that are all about hope in the midst of despair. Daniel's context, when the story is told to us, the context is the exile. And in the Old Testament, there were these great experiences that shaped the writings we know as the Old Testament in our Bible. The creation and the beginnings of humanity, the experience of slavery in Egypt and the exodus led by Moses, the Ten Commandments and the settling of the Promised Land, and the exile that produced some of the greatest literature the world has ever known, the words of our prophets in particular. And Daniel is in that context, in that time frame. The northern kingdom of Israel has already disappeared, having been destroyed by the Assyrian Empire in 722 B.C., in 587 B.C., the remnants of Israel, known as Judah, with its capital in Jerusalem, is attacked, led by King Nebuchadnezzar. The Babylonians conquer much of what we know as the Middle East, and as they come through Israel, they destroy everything they can find. They destroy the temple in Jerusalem. It is laid barren and in despair. Many people are taken away into forced captivity. This is called the exile, and over the waves, beginning in 587 B.C., Anybody who had ever been to school, who had any education, the nobility and the ruling class that they could capture, and anyone who had the skill to do a trade, they were caught and captured and taken away. Those who could escaped and hid in the hills, but many were deported for forced work and labor in Babylon. And in that time, they know as the great captivity, it was a time to demoralize the people. It was known as the exile. And our prophets write much about it, trying to understand how this could happen to the chosen people of God and how the temple of God, if God is all-powerful, how could this despairing thing happen to them? Many commentators today say that this story was actually written down, though, and composed in the second century B.C., just a short period before Jesus Christ arrives. And in that second century B.C., there are again situations that are very similar to the history of Daniel and the Babylonians. The Seleucids in Syria and the Ptolemies in Egypt are warring over the areas of the Middle East, and Israel is in that crossroads. The Seleucids, 
They want to make everyone part of Greek culture. So they outlaw Judaism. You cannot practice your faith. They desecrate the temple. All of these things occur. Later on, there will be a group of priests and a family under the Maccabees who will be coming out of the hills in guerrilla warfare, finally to defeat this group. And they become the leaders of what happens when they rededicate the temple and we celebrate Hanukkah. But this leader of the Seleucids is a guy named Antiochus IV. And many people in the second century said he reminds me of a king in our own history. He's like a second Nebuchadnezzar come to us. And how can we survive these experiences? Daniel is a book for people who are going through extremely difficult moments in their lives. For people who wonder, can they ever have hope again? And the message overall of Daniel is, God will be faithful to you. Whatever it is you face and whatever you go through, remember what God did for us before. We had that long period of deportation and exile, but God was with us and ultimately led us back home. And once again, God will be with us no matter what we face. So there is reason for us to trust His faithfulness. No matter what, despite the circumstances, the message of Daniel is keep hope alive. When I thought about this story, there were two important aspects of it that came to my mind. And I wanted to talk with you about them this morning. One is silence. When Daniel in the book is experiencing exile, he's thinking about a question that his people had asked for many, many years. And it's a question sometimes we ask today. Lord, how long will it be? How much longer before you act? God, how long must we suffer? How much more should we endure? And as he's doing that, he consults the prophet Jeremiah, and Daniel figures out that the exile is supposed to last for a period of 70 years. Generations of people will be a part of the exile. And he's dealing with an issue that a lot of us sometimes experience, and that is silence. I thought about having just a moment of silence coming up here before the sermon and just looking at you. <laughs> it's awkward silence. It can be scary, but it can also be wholesome and good for us too. Mary and I used to get some cheese from a monastery in Kentucky that I'd visited a few times, the Gethsemane Monastery. They were known as Trappist monks. They decided long ago as part of the discipline of their spiritual lives to have an economy of words. So you didn't speak unnecessarily. Some of them had vows of silence that lasted days, weeks, months, even years. So when you ordered the cheese or the chocolate that you could get there, which I also ordered, you couldn't call in the number. You couldn't call and make your order. You had to write it down at that time before we could even do it online. You had to write it and send in your order. And you actually hoped that you got your cheese back from them. But you could never call customer service Nobody would speak to you. There was a famous monk there named Thomas Merton who was so well versed in spiritual affairs that people would come and consult with him. And because so many people were coming to meet with him, they built him a house on the very far edge of their property because of all the talking that was going on during that time. On vacation, we, we stayed at my aunt's house on the beach and in her subdivision area there's a really nice swimming pool and oftentimes there were many people at the pool. I've always loved to swim. In fact, one of the kids this morning asked one of the questions about do you like to swim or something about a swimming pool came up. And I love swimming and I remember one of those days for whatever reason I went down there, rode my bike down there and there was nobody at the swimming pool. It was very unusual. And there's a 10-foot area in the pool, so it's easy to dive in, and I love to swim. There's a sign that says no diving, right? So I dove in, <laughs> right? There's nobody around, and I dive in, and I get out, and I dive in again, and, and I'm swimming, and I swear it was like I was a kid again. I used to get down in the water and go all the way under, and I was doing that, and I was just doing my body in all different ways, and I was just having a ball, and I was coming up and down, and then... I came up one time and I looked and there were these two old guys at the chalet in the pool just looking <laughs> at me. It was pretty awkward, I can tell you. But I enjoyed my silence. My reading at the beach was unbroken about the story of Louis Zamprini who was uh, 
stranded on a raft after his plane crashed in World War II, captured by the Japanese. It's an amazing story of survival, 47 days in a raft. At one point, uh, as three of these airmen are on the raft trying to survive, they come to the equator to an area known as the doldrums. The doldrums is an area where, in the shape of our world, in the, in the nature that we have, there are very little activity of waves. The winds sometimes don't blow for a long period of time. And it was just completely silent for him. He said that in that point, that the stillness of the sea and the silence of the wind was good for him. Even in the midst of all this, could we survive or make it or not? Just being in that stillness and that silence, he said you could stay with a thought for hours and hours and hours. Richard Foster, in his classic books, like celebration of discipline and prayer, finding the heart's true home, quotes a monk from years and years ago, a Christian who talked about the importance of silence, of just sitting and being with God in prayer. This is what he said. He said, I have shown you how thoroughly silence heals and fully is pleasing to God. By silence the saints grew, because of silence, the power of God dwelt in them. Because of silence, the mysteries of God were made known to them. I heard an old Baptist preacher put it this way. Don't just do something, sit there. That's good advice for us in this world and in the things that we face in it. But what about long periods of silence from God? What about the prayer that many of us have prayed how much longer, God, when will we hear from you? This is the way Daniel approached that. When he was in the midst of searching and how much longer in the exile and all the despair of his people and his own life, he went to God in prayer. I'm reminded of the old hymn that we sing sometimes that says, Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because... We do not carry everything to God in prayer. And as he prays, he is honest. He doesn't just do intercessory prayer, which is primarily what you and I probably do. Lord, help me, give me, do this, or be with those. He laments. He's honest about the pain he's experiencing and the problems and the concerns and the worries. And you heard it. In the end of what Renda read for us in that portion, help us, help us, help us now. Come, God. There's lamenting in that voice. Did you hear it? How much longer, God? This is terrible what we're facing and what we're going through. And in that, there's also a deep sense of humility. In their humiliation, he says, this is really not the doings of Babylon. It is your doing, God. You have done this, and we rightly deserve whatever punishment you bring to us. Walter Brueggemann, a great Old Testament scholar, I think gets it a little wrong here, but he says this is the time in the exile when God is sloughing off the people. It's like scraping the dead skin off of your body, sloughing them off, because they refused over menless attempts to hear from prophets to repent and return to God, and yet they refused over and over again and so he was sort of sloughing them off in a way. And the people of Israel were, had this great fear. They were afraid that God would abandon them because throughout their ancient world, that's what happened to other peoples and their gods, driven from their temples by war and famine and all those kinds of things. One scholar said, no, this is a little different here. Think about it. God is not driven from the temple in Jerusalem. God chooses to leave the temple in Jerusalem. God chooses to leave because of the sinfulness that is unrepented. The people who choose over and over again to consult every other person and every other thing in the world for their answers and their needs, but they do not go to God and sit in prayer. And so God abandons the temple. It appears He also abandons the people. But if you'll notice in the prophets, in the words of Daniel and others, God has said, I will leave the temple and as you go, I will go with you. 
And in that foreign land of despair and hopelessness where you sit and worry and wring your hands and wonder, can we ever sing the songs of Zion again under these old trees that are not our trees? How can we live like this? God says, I will be there with you, sitting with you, weeping with you, and reshaping your heart, preparing you for the day when I will bring you home again. Because the relationship never ends, no matter what happens in the circumstances of our lives. Jeremiah was told when the war was bearing down on him, go ahead and put a down payment on the field in Anatoth. Because one day your people will return and this land will be yours once again. This is not about a story of a God out there somewhere. Daniel learned this is a story of a God who is right here, near us. So Daniel felt very confident that he could sit in the presence of God even in the foreign land of Babylon, even in the pain of exile. God would be there. The doldrums happen to all of us. The wind doesn't blow. The sea's not moving. We despair and we feel sad and we wonder what we're going to do and how we're going to face what we have to face that has come upon us in this life. But the silence doesn't mean that there has been absence. God is still with us. This is a political season. I'm sure you've noticed that. There are signs everywhere. Conventions have been held on one side and the other. I even get stuff on my Twitter feed for different politicians. Even Spotify that I like to listen to every day when I'm here working has this ad that pops up now. And I'm sure I'll see a lot more of those political ads. From the beginning, we Baptists said it is not wrong to ignore politics. We should be involved in the political systems of our world. We have the right in America, they said, to have the redress of grievances. And because of Baptists, the Bill of Rights are created. We had a big part in that. But one of the things that I see happen sometimes in our political situation and when we look at the ills of our country is that we blame the politicians and the leaders. And maybe there is blame there. But there is also blame in us, right? It is a system that we are part of. I remember when we went to Fort Sumter on our trip, we saw about where the cannons were fired and all the different things they did. And I remembered a story from the Korean War where somebody was talking about the process that the Army Manual had for how you fire a certain artillery weapon. And they had all these steps you go through, how to load it, where you stand. And there was one guy who had to stand so many feet off to the back where the gun would be fired. But he just stood there. And nobody could really figure out why he was standing there until someone figured out that the reason that happened is that when artillery weapons were being first used, horses had to pull the big guns. And when they fired them, the horses would run off. So somebody had to hold the horses. Long after the time when there were no more horses, the manual was still saying, the guy that holds the horses is going to that spot. It's sort of strange. But I tell you that to say that things we do can become part of a system that happens over generations in us. Have you ever been the first one to clap at a theater? Or somebody's been doing that? Have you ever been the first one and then others began to happen? It's amazing the influence that you and I have in our lives. I have a son who will be 16 this year and get his driver's license. We know that kids watch us as we drive, right? They learn the habits we do, and those habits we have often influence the habits we are. We were talking the other day when we were driving, where do you put your hands? And I'm thinking, I probably don't set the best model where I put my hand on long drives. It needs to be better placed for me. And prejudices can reside in us, in our grandparents, and in our parents, and in us, and we hand those things off to the nations. When Daniel is saying to God, you did this to us because we deserved it, he is repenting not only for his own sin, but for the sins of all of his people. Because this is a generational thing that happens. And in our own nation, we have to all realize it's not just people in cities or where races are conflicting against each other or whatever the situations are. We have to realize our own complicity 
in all of the things and the ills of this world that happen. And so instead of turning to God, we have turned to others. We've refused to repent and we've pointed fingers at other people. My mama always told me when you point one finger at yourself, you got fingers, three fingers pointing back at yourself. This is what I think happens for us. Oscar Romero, who was a bishop in El Salvador, who was assassinated in church in 1980, said these words about his nation. How easy it is to denounce structural injustice, institutionalized violence, social sin. And it is true, this sin is everywhere, but where are the roots of this social sin? In the heart of every human being, that's where it is. Present day society is a sort of anonymous world in which no one is willing to admit guilt and everyone is responsible. We are still sinners and we have all contributed to this massive crime and violence in our country, he said. Salvation begins with the human person, with human dignity, with saving every person from sin. Think about your prayers. How often are your prayers we and not just I or me? How often do we think about the connectedness we have in the systems of our world? I remember the Three Musketeers. Maybe it's a good slogan for us to remember. All for one and one for all. Unless we can come together and realize not only the possibilities to make a difference in the world, but also our own complicity in the wrongs and the ills of the world, unless we quit pointing fingers at others and take responsibility for ourselves and repent of our own sins, our world will not be the world that God dreams that it could be. This is part of Daniel's honest prayer to God. I've often thought someday I will try to do a sermon where James versus Paul and I'll have Luther and Billy Graham with Paul. And I'll have Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Walter Rauschenbusch with James. Paul says, you're saved and all you need is faith. And James says, I like it, but I want to see your works. If you got faith, I want to see you doing something. And that's part of what this prayer is about here. I read a story recently about the Coast Guard in the Pacific section of our nation. And they have, they said, three or four boats. And last year they seized four or five billion dollars worth of illegal cocaine shipments that come through the Pacific Ocean. But they said it's like trying to find a needle in the haystack. And it was interesting reading the stories of these sailors in the Coast Guard and they said there's hours and hours of just searching the horizon and there's all these ways that people try to come in and trick us. And sometimes you can feel despair. What little difference can we make? But occasionally we do make some difference. And we have to hold on to that, they said. We have to hold on that we're actually making some difference. And keeping the poison that can hurt the little boys and little girls in the streets of our nation. There was an attorney that spoke to the teachers at the Madison City Schools this week. An African American attorney who grew up in the public school system. And she reminded the teachers, and I think it's a lesson all of us could hear, that even the little things that we do may have tremendous impacts on people's lives in the world today. Not only should we repent of our sins, we are called to do something about making the world a better place than it currently is. And even the little things we do can matter. This woman said there was a librarian they wanted to help her. She had a speech impediment, an issue with her speech. But the doorway to the resource room where you would go to get help with your speech was where all the popular folks hung out. And she said, I was smart. And I didn't want them to think that I wasn't smart. I had to walk right in front of them. And the librarian said, hey, come here. There's a little secret passageway. You can go in the back. And she did that day in and day out. There was a teacher, a seventh grade history teacher, who asked her one day when she saw her reading, what are you reading? And she told her and she said, you need to be reading biographies. Read stories of ordinary people who did extraordinary things in the world. And she said it inspired her to be extraordinary in this world. 
When we were on vacation, we went to Boone Hall, an old plantation pre-Revolutionary War in Charleston, South Carolina. There's a famous avenue of oaks, oak trees that were planted over 250 years ago by one of the Boone founders of the plantation. And he is buried there underneath the oaks. He's the only member of the family buried there because he said, I want to sit there and watch my oak trees forever. He doesn't get to do that, right? <laughs> but he did something important. He planted trees and he doesn't get to see the results and the beauty of the trees. Those happened many, many years later. There's a book I still have on my shelf. And it says, does your child's world scare you? It was written in the 90s. And I think it's still true for a lot of us. My call for us today is to remember the story of Daniel. And he had two important lessons for us. Sit and then do. That's the rhythm and the balance of what I've entitled my sermon, Reaffirming Our Faith. I think our faith is strengthened and renewed when we do those two spiritual practices over and over again and strike the balance of sitting with God, listening, questioning, reflecting, and also doing something. Doing the things that God would have us do in this world. This is the way the commentator closes the book about Daniel. The courageous stories of Daniel's life in Babylon show a tenacious belief despite terrible odds that one individual's life can make a difference for good. That's our task. Sit and do. Sit and do. Some people think that Daniel remained active in the government of his day. And he whispered somewhere to someone who finally got the ear of the king Cyrus the Great of Persia. And it was Cyrus's edict in 538 that said, let the people go. Maybe it was Daniel whose simple whisper and sitting prayer and attempt to do something about the ills of his society made all the difference with the simple words, let my people go. We've heard that before, haven't we? I'm in. Hello, I'm Mike Oliver. I'm the senior pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church. I'd like to thank you for joining us for worship through our church website. And also, I'd like to invite you to come and visit us. This is a great church. We have friendly people here. We value worship. We value community and global missions. And there are programs for children all the way to senior adults. I think you'll like our church, and I hope you'll come and visit us and see for yourself in person. If you have questions about our church, like to know more, we'd love for you to contact us. There's information on our website. You can call us or email us or come by, and one of our staff members will be glad to talk with you. Welcome to Trinity, and God bless you and keep you.